It's going to take a few minutes to explain to you how blessed I am that it's Christmas. <laughs> I love Christmas, as you can tell. It's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> I mean, it just absolutely is. And uh, so... I just want to uh, challenge you this morning a little bit during this time of year because this is an opportune time to share the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and we're the ones that have to do it. If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you have an opportunity to do something that where there's an open door that normally there may not be an open door. It's kind of interesting because, um, you know, I, w I was raised in a church that was huge. It was the Cathedral of St. Philip's, an Episcopal church, and we walked the aisles every Sunday morning. I was in a boys' choir. I had a wonderful experience doing that, but at Christmas time, everything was just the, the, the grandeur and the glory of it was amazing. I mean, they decorated, they, they left no, no stone unturned when they decorated. It was great, great and powerful, and it was awesome to walk into these beautiful decorations that they'd make every year. And then we would walk down an aisle of a huge cathedral on Christmas Eve, about 11 o'clock at night. <coughs> and back then, uh, there was only three TV stations, and one TV station every year would broadcast, so there'd be TV cameras everywhere, and there'd be an orchestra, and we'd walk through and sing glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. It was a wonderful time of year. I'll never forget it. And then I, then I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Re I really did. I had, an under, uh, I had an understanding of who he was. I accepted him as Lord in my life. It was an amazing experience. And it changed the idea of Christmas for me. And I came into the Christmas season with this understanding that that's what it was all about. It was really all about the birth of Jesus because for me up until that point, everything kind of hinged off what happened on Christmas Eve and the next Christmas morning, which was a glorious time because we had a huge Christmas tree in the living room and toys presents, gifts, and we were blessed to have that in our family. But when I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, it became important for me to make sure that everyone knew that that was the real reason for the season. It was about Jesus. It was about the birth of Jesus. And I started going to a church that began to really shun any other explanation or expression of Christmas and I followed right behind it I got right behind it and I was into that for years Santa Claus was a demon you know and trees were just they, they were they were they came from an origin that I didn't want to be connected to and so I got kind of religious about it and I began to realize that I was isolating myself from an opportunity that I wasn't seizing in the midst of a season when many hearts are tender. They're, they're open. And they know what the season's all about. They actually do. I mean, most people know. I don't think you'll meet anyone that has ever experienced Christmas that doesn't know that basically what we're doing, most for the most part, what Christians are doing is they're celebrating the introduction of peace, hope, grace, and mercy on the earth. They don't understand the full meaning of it, but they know that we think that. And we have an opportunity to penetrate their spirits and their hearts with the grace and the mercy and the introduction of Jesus Christ. If we don't try to go in and explain to them what the problem with what they are celebrating is, but interject the light that outshines it all. And it kind of changed my view of Christmas. I, didn't, I started not having a problem with trees and Santa Claus and gifts and garland and lights and all that stuff. 
because it brought people into a place where I had an open door. And I began to see changes in my opportunities to minister to people. And then I became a pastor. And I had the opportunity every Christmas to preach and bring a message about Christmas. And so every time I would read the stories, both in Matthew and Luke, about the birth of Jesus, I'd get a new revelation every time. How many of you know when you read the word in the influence of the Spirit of God, it brings a different revelation every time? It always points to the same thing, but it brings a different revelation. And this year it was kind of interesting. I'm reading through the stories and I'm thinking about the things that took place before the birth of Jesus, the advent of Jesus. And I started seeing a pattern. Now listen, I'm not a pattern person, but I saw something very interesting in the, in the things that took place before the birth of Jesus that got me kind of stirred up. I found out that every time there was an encounter, there's a divine appointment. Now, this is under the Old Covenant. We're still in the Old Covenant at this point. And I looked at Zacharias when he went into the temple to do his work, and he had a dramatic encounter with an angel. I, most of you have read that story. And he's confronted with this angel, and the angel tells him about the birth of Jesus, but he knows he's far beyond the ability for him and his wife to bring children into the earth and the angel says, this is going to take place. And he questions the angel. And he encounters the authority of the angel because it t the angel takes away his capacity to speak so he doesn't mess up this miracle. And he walks out. And everybody knows, based on the look on his face and what they're seeing on Zacharias, that he has seen, he has had some type of an encounter. And Zacharias leaves that encounter and fulfills a divine appointment. It probably surprised him as much as it did Elizabeth. And they conceive and have a child. And then you know the story of Mary. Mary's just minding her own business one day, and she sees a light that comes into a room, and she has an encounter with the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel begins to give her the understanding of what's fixing to take place. You're going to be found with child. And you're going to name him this, and he's going to be this, this, and this. And she says, be it as you have said unto your servant. And she receives the encounter and fulfills the divine appointment by giving birth to Jesus. And every time, everything that took place from that point on, there was a divine encounter that met a divine appointment. Every time. Joseph had divine uh, encounters in his dreams with the angel Gabriel and told him to take Mary as his wife when he was going to put her away. He has a divine encounter and fulfills a divine appointment. And then the angels, I mean the, the shepherds, just like you saw up here, you know the story. The shepherds are sitting out minding their own business and all of a sudden, the angels, the, the heavens open up and the angels begin to come down and they're singing glory to God. And they bring the salutation to the shepherds and the shepherds are engulfed in this divine encounter. And they leave this divine encounter and they go and they worship Jesus. They find exactly what the angels said they find. And then there's the wise guys. I mean, these guys have had to have some type of incredible encounter with God. It wasn't just something they read in a book. Something caused them to know and see that something had taken place. A king has been born, and we've seen his star, and we're following his star, and they go to Herod, and they try to find Jesus, and Herod doesn't know what they're talking about, but they end up finding Jesus because of the encounter that they had and they see where the, where the star rests, and they find Jesus, and they bring to him gold, incense, and myrrh. A divine encounter always 
births a divine appointment. And then I started looking back in the scriptures in the Old Testament. I started seeing a pattern. Every time under the Old Covenant, there was a divine encounter. There was a divine appointment. There was something someone was supposed to fulfill. And I started looking at my own life. And I began to realize that I have had an encounter. I'll never forget the day I gave my life to Jesus. And months later, I sat in a service where I was taught about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I went home that night and I sat, I got in my living room, I was by myself. And I knelt down in a chair, before a chair. And I asked the Lord to baptize me in His Holy Spirit. And I raised my hands. I said, Lord, give me whatever you got. I want it. And I got baptized in authority and power and anointing that night. I'll never forget it. I, didn't, you, I, I wasn't speaking in tongues or anything. I just knew something had happened because I was shaking under the power of the Lord. But I didn't understand that when there's a divine encounter, there's always the opportunity for a divine appointment. I saw appointments show up. Sometimes I'd seize them, sometimes I wouldn't. But I didn't understand this pattern. And then the Lord showed me something the other day. He said, and this is what I'm hearing from the Spirit of God as I'm, I'm, I'm researching this out. Divine appointments always came as a result of encounter under the Old Covenant. Under the New Covenant, you have a divine encounter with the Spirit of God when you receive Him. But when you receive Him, you have Him, and you become a divine appointment. So no longer are you looking for a divine appointment. You are a divine appointment. You carry the opportunity for someone else to experience the, an encounter that you had. So you are the divine appointment. So the Lord says this to me. Do you want to have a divine appointment? I said, yes, because I used to say, Lord, and Alice and I used to pray this way, Lord, give us a divine appointment today. And the Lord spoke to me the other day, and he said this, you decide when you want to be a divine appointment, and you get to be one. Because you carry the encounter. The encounter is not something that happened. It's something you carry. It's something you have. It's something you're walking with. It's something that's stirring on the inside of you. I... Uh, I didn't ask uh, Sid if I could s tell, tell this this morning, but he does it out in the open, so I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> uh, last week, I, I called Sid up, and I said, uh, Sid, I'd like to, he came into town. I said, I'd like to have lunch with you or breakfast, and he said, sure. So we met one morning for breakfast at a small cafe, and Sid never disappoints me because everywhere he goes he always speaks to the waitress or the waiter when they're waiting on us about the Lord and we had a long meal we talked for a couple of hours had a wonderful time and I was paying for the meal so I got up to pay for the meal we kind of said our goodbyes at the table and I thought well okay this is one time I see where he he didn't do anything and I got up and went to the to the cash register to pay for the bill and Sid follows me over there and the lady that's taking the money, he begins to drum up a conversation with her and begins to tell her about a relationship with a God that she has the opportunity to make because he's there. Wow. Wow. I thought that was interesting. What I realized that day was that this guy believes he's a divine appointment wherever he goes. And I watched the face of the waitress as he was talking to her. And this, is, this was the perception that I got. I didn't, I didn't get this from what she says, but the perception I had was this. She doesn't really care about what Sid's saying. And so as I was thinking that, I walked to the restroom, and Sid was still talking to her. When I got out, he had left, and she was there. And I thought, well, that was quick. That, was, that didn't take long. And uh, she didn't receive anything. Nothing, nothing happened. And she probably didn't care. And based on what I could see in her eyes, I thought, you know, no, nothing took place there. So it, while, while Sid tried to bring a message of hope, she didn't receive it. And I thought, well, that's too bad. And I walked out. I got in my car. 
and began to crank my car up, and the Spirit of God said these words to me. He said, she encountered a divine appointment. And no matter what she said or what you saw in her eyes, what she heard, she will never, ever forget. I thought, wow. I just took for granted because she didn't have this receiving antenna going on and the eyes that were, were desirous to hear more that she brushed it off. And the Spirit of God said, what she heard, she'll never forget. I, got, I cranked my car up and I said, now, Lord, so what you're telling me is that every time we speak or we open our hearts to deliver the word of truth, they will never forget. He said, yes, they'll never forget. That's my job. And then I came under conviction because I realized I'm a very quiet person. And I started thinking back of the years before I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The few times I found myself in the presence of someone who carried what I now carry. And the things that they said to me, I can tell you almost verbatim what they said. I know exactly how I felt when they said them, and I know why I turned away when I did. But I never forgot, <laughs> ever. And the Lord spoke to me that day, and he said, every time you open your mouth, every time you become an encounter for someone else, they will never forget it. And I started thinking about Christmas in a little bit different view. Because here's the reality. Christmas is a time when people are thinking, whether they know it or not, in the back of their minds, they're thinking, okay, yes, birth of Jesus. Most theologians will tell you it didn't happen during this actual season. But we, this, this, is what we, this is what we've ended up with. What are we doing with it? How are we using what we've been given? How are we becoming the encounter that the world needs? And would you dare decide to be the divine appointment that you have the opportunity to be, if not if it comes, not if it supernaturally happens, but if you want to? So here's the, thing with the, here's the thing the Lord showed me. The ball is not in his court. It's just not there anymore. It's been thrown over into your court. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you are walking in the opportunity, whenever you want to take it, of a divine appointment. <laughs> No matter how you see it or how it looks to you, when you express the grace, the mercy, and the love of Jesus Christ, not the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you know that your job is not to convict people of sin. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. He's come, He's been given to convict the world of sin. You've been given the opportunity to express the love of Jesus Christ to people that need to hear it. And it's interesting to me, it, it, it's so interesting to, actually it's a little disturbing to me to, to understand in the statistical realm that this is the time of year when people are the most depressed. If you have any form of depression, it accelerates during this time of year. The very time of year that the church should, and the church should be expressing the hope and the love and the grace and the mercy and the peace of Jesus Christ. It's, it's interesting that this is the time of year when the satanic forces in heavenly places takes opportunity to bring something when it should be just the opposite. Isn't that interesting? They say suicide attempts are up during this time of year. I'm going, what? Not while the church is around. Not while they're Bible-believing, spirit-filled believers on the planet. 
No, it should not be. I was thinking the other day that this should be the most outreaching time of the year for the body of Christ. Because there's no celebration in the secular world that meets the Christians at the level that it happens during Christmas. Nothing else. Easter's not that big a deal to them. I mean, you know, bunny rabbits, it's just not a big deal. But Santa Claus, that's a whole nother level. <laughs> I'm thinking, what's an opportunity that could take place in the life of my, in, in my life that would open a door for me to express the grace and the love of Jesus Christ during this time. Wow. This could be the most life-changing Christmas you ever had. This could be the greatest opportunity you've ever had to bring life and light into the life of someone else. Now, I'm not, I can't tell you how to do it. But I can tell you this, when you decide to live in the encounter, you will become a divine appointment in the lives of others. Now, for you, that might mean coming into contact with what you carry, stirring up what's on the inside of you already, forgetting about what you are going through for the sake of seeing someone else receive the hope you have. Because I'll, I'll, I'll admit, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting time of year. And if you're not where you want to be right now, here's what the Lord showed me this morning was this. He wants to dramatically remind you of what you carry so that you can live the divine appointment. And he wants to do it this morning. You might say, Mac, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, this might be the morning for you to discover that. This is a good opportunity to receive the hope of glory and salvation for, to eternal life. It's a great opportunity to do that. I'm going to ask the band to come up. You guys, come on up. We're going to move back into worship, and we're, we are going to take communion this morning, but I want to take just a moment. To give you an opportunity to respond to one of two things. First of all, if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, and God's speaking to you this morning, I want to challenge you to let us pray with you this morning. And number two, this. If you said th this morning, I don't feel like there's an encounter inside of me. I don't feel like I'm carrying encounter. I've had it. I've, I, I, I've been there before, but I'm just not there now. But I want to get there. I want to walk out of here knowing that I carry and I've, I, I, I'm in the presence of a divine encounter because of the Spirit of God that lives on the inside of me. I want to know that I'm carrying that inside so that I can decide when I want to to be a divine appointment. I was challenged by the Lord the other day, just this, this past week. He said, you know, you could have a divine appointment every day. And he said, it's not all about what you say. You've been called to express the goodness of God through good works. like paying for the groceries of the person in front of you or the guy behind you. 
or doing something that expresses the love of Jesus Christ and become that divine appointment. And always remember this, when you open your mouth, when you dare to say something to someone about the love of Jesus Christ, and you don't see the response that you would hope to see, and you may have been even brushed off or ridiculed as a result of it, know this, even when, when rejection comes with persecution, they will never forget it. Which means that you've done one of two things. You've either planted a seed or you've watered a seed. You've either planted a seed or you've watered a seed. And many people are walking around with a dry seed. They just need to hear it from one other person. They just need to hear it one more time. They just need to have someone put their arm around them and care about them one more time. They need to sense the presence of the Lord one more time. Did you know people, here's what I've discovered. When you begin to reach out as a divine appointment into the lives of others, you don't even have to say his name if there's seed that's being watered. It's amazing what God will do with someone who walks in the reality of divine appointment. And here's the reality. We're a community of believers that makes a difference. Right? That's who God's called us to become. And that doesn't mean that it's here where you make a difference. You can't make a difference in here. It's out there that you make a difference. And it's an easy word. It's not a hard word. All you have to do is be carriers of the encounter. And then you become a divine appointment. So this morning, I want to ask you one or two things. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to come up here. Well, let's do this. Bow your heads just, just for a moment. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I just want you to raise your hand wherever you are. Anyone in here that would say, I don't know Jesus as Lord, but I'd love to. Amen. Yeah. While your head's about, let me ask you this. If you are not feeling like you're a carrier of encounter, you know, you know that you know you have been, but you've You've, you've lost that, that zeal of encounter that's on the inside of you, the thing that stirs you to touch the lives of others. And you want that rekindled. You just want it stirred up again. I want you to raise your hand wherever you are. Amen. Anyone else? Yes, yes. Anyone else? You just want it rekindled. that's you, I want to invite you to come up and let us pray for you this morning. Would you let us do that? Just stand up where you are. Come on up to the front. Come on up. Come on up, brother. Come on up. Anyone else? Yeah. Come on up. Just stand right along here. We're going to pray for you. God's a God of encounter. He loves to touch and stir on the inside. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? just a moment this is a divine this is a divine opportunity right here right now yeah yeah so God wants to do this this morning so I'm going to anoint you with oil and I'm going to ask the Lord to reveal something to you in your spirit but to do a stirring you've got to go with the stir <laughs> don't fight it let him do whatever he wants to do let him reveal and if you want to begin to pray in the spirit, you can. If you want to pray in the understanding, you can. Just worship with the worship team while they're worshiping. And just let God do what he wants to do. Now go ahead. <laughs> 